All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kem. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode 74, and first things first, change of scenery number one behind me, and be anticipating a lot more of the same over the next couple weeks, and the reason for this will be abundantly clear very soon, and I will be making a formal announcement when the time is right, but for now, I will simply say that if you haven't already, please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube, and click that little notification button, because what I have coming up here on the channel is going to change the field of ancient history research forever. That being said, the topic for today's video, ancient sulfur mining, as related to the sulfuric acid manufacturing within the Great Pyramid of Giza. This is a topic that I've been waiting to cover for quite some time as it continues to paint the beautiful picture of the practical yet fascinating technology that was being utilized by the ancient pre-dynastic Egyptian civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, like I said before, you do not want to miss what I have coming up here on the Land of Chem over the next couple of weeks, so please subscribe and stay tuned. If you want to help support the channel, just go to thelandofchem.com. You can pick up a limited first edition print copy of the book, grab some merch. Either way, all the orders mean the world to me. Thank you all so much for the support. If you want to follow me on Instagram, now is the perfect time. My handle is at thelandofchem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's intro, so without further ado, Let's get right to it. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. And the topic for today's video, sulfur. One of my personal favorite elements, and I usually dislike the color yellow for yellow clothing, yellow cars, etc. But I find the color of both the raw forms of sulfur that you can see here and the crystalline form of sulfur that you can see here to be extremely compelling. And of course, the first uses of sulfur in the conventional historical record date back to nowhere else but ancient Egypt, as does most everything else that we do and use these days, and the first records of sulfur being used are around 1600 BCE, where the ancient Egyptians were using it to make dyes and pigments, which we will be touching on again here shortly. But they were also using this element for making pharmaceutical medicines, Egypt again being the birthplace of all of these manufacturing processes. And yes, they were also using it for agriculture, as we have been discussed in the form of ammonium sulfate fertilizers. So as I've proposed in the book and thoroughly explained here, all, the ammonia solution that was being produced in the Red Pyramid of Dashur was being converted into urea in the Bent Pyramid, but could have also been transformed by a very simple tweak of the chemistry into ammonium sulfate fertilizer by a process that you can see here, which is mixing dilute solutions of sulfuric acid and aqueous ammonia, two chemicals which should already sound very, very familiar, and then evaporating the solution and removing the water to leave solid ammonium sulfate fertilizer. And I just happened to find this diagram in my research for this episode, which essentially summarizes the basic chemical operations that I have laid out regarding the products of the Egyptian pyramids. So we have natural gas here at the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara. That methane was being used to render hydrogen in a new structure that we will be discussing soon, and it is also transformed into ammonia here in the Red Pyramid of Dashur. The sulfur, air, and water, again the sulfur being the raw material topic for today's episode, was being converted into sulfur trioxide and then sulfuric acid in the Great Pyramid of Giza. And then you can mix that dilute sulfuric acid solution with your aqueous ammonia solution produce ammonium sulfate as shown previously and this fertilizer wasn't just being of course the nile river has amazing fertile soil and doesn't really need fertilizer but as explained back in episode 25 the egyptian pyramids were in operation during the saharan wet period from around 8500 bc to 5300 BC, and I will put a link in the video description below, but here is a brief synopsis of the Egyptian timeline that I think simply needs to be pushed back a few thousand years to incorporate this period in history, which is absolutely a part of the pre-dynastic Egyptian civilization. So prior to 8500 BC that you can see over here on the left, the Egyptians were living around the Nile River 
and the Upper Eastern Sahara was a complete desert. And I believe this is the period when pyramid building began, coinciding with the beginning of the significant rainfall that started around 8500 BC. This is a period in documented archaeological history when the Egyptian civilization spread out from around the Nile River and began to farm this previously uninhabitable area. They were literally transforming the desert into a massive area of fertile, arable farmland, terraforming the desert with the help of rain into an area that they could use for crops and raising cattle, both of which should already sound familiar as directly related to the methane manufacturing at the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara, and fertilizers that were being produced in the Red and Bent Pyramids of Dashur were directly related to transforming this desert into farmland. These structures were in operation for almost 3,000 years, supporting the tremendous agriculture and industry of this prolific ancient civilization, until the rains suddenly stopped and the redesiccation of the Sahara began around 5300 BC. No amount of fertilizer can save you if you don't have any water, so the population returned to the areas around the Nile River that you can see over here on the right, coinciding with the beginning of the dynastic Egyptian civilization around 3500 BC. As depicted in the reunification of Upper and Lower Egypt that is depicted on the Narmer or Menes palette, which according to conventional archaeology marks the beginning of Egyptian civilization, but they ignore the fact that for the previous 3,000 years, as shown here, they were completely spread out, and now around 3500 BC, they are reunifying and coming back together around the Nile River, and this is the time period that we know as the beginning of dynastic Egypt. But the pyramids had already gone out of operation almost 2,000 years before. Pyramids in operation. There would have been mining for raw materials such as precious metals, silver and gold, industrial metals like lead, copper, iron, etc., production materials like sulfur, and so on. And there are deposits of sulfur located around the Mediterranean and also in Egypt as documented here in this article that would have been mined for this precious resource, whether it be for making medicine or making sulfuric acid in the Great Pyramid. And this article discusses the origins of native sulfur deposits, meaning that they are naturally occurring in that area in a place in Egypt called Gebel el Zayt which you can see here near the Sinai Peninsula. And here is a bit further back. So this is Gebel el Zayt over here. And this is where the pyramids are up here near Cairo. And this entire area here near Aswan would have absolutely been used as a massive quarry area. And here at Aswan, the stone quarries are right near the river. So the stones could have been transported downstream to the pyramid sites. And remember, the Nile is only one of two rivers in the entire world that flows south to north. So the stones were floated directly from the quarry sites down the river to the construction sites. Same here with the materials from Gebel el Zayt. Most likely they were transported inland and then shipped by boat downstream to Giza. And we know that the ancient Egyptians had mining operations in Gebel el Zayt because it is documented in the historical record for its Galena mines. And yes, there are historical records of ancient Egyptian mining and all sorts of other industries as depicted here in this spectacular artwork showing the Galena mines of Gebel el Zayt by Jean-Claude Golvin. And I'm so glad I found the name of this artist because now I can give him credit for the absolutely stunning depictions of the other sites in Egypt, like this one shown previously from Abu Ghraib. And I will put a link to his website in the video description below. It is definitely worth a look because this guy does absolutely amazing work. And quickly back to Galena. This mineral, which is composed of lead sulfide, was being mined in ancient Egypt, not only as a source of lead, but also for silver another precious metal that also would have been of particular importance to this civilization. So Galena often contains deposits of silver. So commercially, they are often mined from the same mines, which also often contain antimony, copper, and zinc. Any of this sound familiar? 
It definitely should to any of you that have watched part two of the Red Pyramid Chemical Analysis. And if you haven't, this is an absolutely must watch episode and I will put a link in the video description below. And don't forget, lead was also found prominently in the chemical analysis of the metallic coating compound that was discovered sealing container number two on the second level of the Osiris shaft, which you can see highlighted here, along with titanium, arsenic, zinc, and iron, all of which we have discussed before here in the chemical analysis on the Egyptian saw blades. So I hope you're starting to see the bigger picture of this ancient pre-dynastic civilization in Egypt that was mining and quarrying a variety of minerals and stone for construction, industrial, agricultural, and of course, chemical applications. And the minerals specifically were then being taken and chemically processed and separated using acidic solutions to produce a variety of products and compounds such as the metallic sealer that you're looking at here. But ladies and gentlemen, this is just the beginning. All right, everyone, just a quick reminder that if you want to help support the channel, just check out thelandofchem.com. I have brand new Land of Chem merch. There's hoodies, long sleeve shirts, t-shirts, in a variety of different colors with both different logos. And of course, the genesis for the entire Land of Chem YouTube channel, my book, The Land of Chem, an initiation into ancient chemistry through the degrees of the Egyptian pyramid. So if you want to help support the channel, just check out the website. You can grab some merch, pick up a copy of the book. Either way, all of the orders mean more to me than words can possibly ever describe. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. All right now, back to the sulfur, which was clearly well known about, being mined, and being chemically transformed into a variety of products in ancient Egypt, such as the chemically resistant coating compound that I recently discussed in episode 66. And the video description today will be full of links because that episode is one of the best videos that I have ever made and it contains absolutely critical information. And the reddish brown coating compound, which you can see here, that onto the exterior of the Red Pyramid of Dashur, is mostly made from sulfur, silicon and oxygen as you can see here in the breakdown in the chemical analysis and there is something very unique here about how this sulfur was utilized and you can see abundant concentration of sulfur here in one of these samples and the full chemical breakdown shows that sulfur in the solid so3 form coming in on average at about 50 percent of total concentration in these two samples and about 33% of the total concentration in this third sample. So this solid SO3 is a sulfur polymer, which would have had to have been chemically processed from the raw sulfur that they were mining. This is literal proof of the industrial scale chemical manufacturing operations that I have proposed, as this paint could not exist without intentional large scale production from raw materials to final product. And as explained before in episode 66, when made into an oligomer with the silicon and infused metal microparticles that were found in these samples would have produced a product similar to the chemically resistant self repair copolymer that was presented in this article from the Royal Society of Chemistry. And yes, I have also proposed that sulfur was being utilized within the Great Pyramid of Giza for the production of a dilute solution of sulfuric acid it is very similar to our modern day contact process for the production of sulfuric acid here. This furnace chamber being the king's chamber, the antechamber here, the grand gallery or collection chamber here, and the queen's chamber or extraction chamber here. And I'll be doing several new episodes on the function of the Great Pyramid coming up soon, so please subscribe and stay tuned. And I haven't gotten to the explanation of this part yet, but it turns out that one of the byproducts of the extremely exothermic reaction producing this sulfuric acid within the Great Pyramid is extremely hot water. And this function is directly related to these new Doppler radar scans and diagrams. And the full explanation will be coming up soon, but it turns out that there is something very interesting that you can do with hot water that is directly related to sulfur mining which is something called the frash process. And this is how I propose the ancient Egyptian civilization was mining sulfur from the prolific salt deposits across the country and even across the world. I don't mean to limit the scope of access to raw materials from Egypt, but I like to show evidence that everything we have discussed here on the channel 
can and has been historically documented as being sourced in Egypt. But this was absolutely a civilization involved in global trade. So this type of mining could have been occurring anywhere where there were sulfur deposits, and they could have used some of the chemicals and technology that we just discussed from the Step Pyramid Complex. So the frash process involves a three-tiered pipe. One large one here on the middle and one pipe in the center. And the pipe is drilled into the underground sulfur deposit. Then heated water that could have been heated with a methane natural gas flame is pumped into the outside pipe. Compressed air is forced into the center pipe. The hot water melts the sulfur deposit and the molten liquid flows back up through the middle pipe. An absolutely ingenious process. And now just envision the wind powered pumps moving underground water to the surface that can sit this mechanism on top of a sulfur mining well, providing either the compressed air or the sulfur removal pumping that is using natural gas heated water to melt the underground sulfur and pump it to the surface for collection. So now I hope you can see how all of the pieces are starting to come together. This was an extremely practical ancient civilization that utilized chemistry and physics to achieve absolutely monumental accomplishments. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 74, Ancient Sulfur Mining. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. And in the next episode in the series, I will finally be revealing the chemical analysis from samples taken of the iron oxide deposits found all over the Giza Plateau. This is another monumental discovery presented in conjunction between the Land of Chem and the Acida Project. Shout out once again to the team for providing me with this amazing research. And ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, I know we're in a bit of a transition period here on the Land of Chem, but trust me, what I have coming up here on the channel is, is going to change the field of ancient history research forever. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Land of Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification button and stay tuned. If you want to help support the channel, just go to thelandofchem.com. You can pick up a limited first edition print copy of the book, grab some merch. Either way, all the orders mean the world to me. Thank you all so much for the support. If you want to follow me on Instagram, now is the perfect time. My handle is at the Land of Chem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's video. So I will see you next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to the Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.